Hi there, welcome to Art in Focus. Uh, this is our third one of the year and uh, everybody uh, joining us on Zoom tonight, thank you, I appreciate it. Um, and I, I'd like to thank the people who are watching from our YouTube channel as well. We're streaming this live to YouTube and we have um, attendees uh, on both platforms. So that's great. It's nice to see both of those being used. Um, just a reminder, uh, these presentations are uh, more or less immediately available, uh, archived on our YouTube channel um, after the presentation tonight. They're also uh, posted to our website um, on our Art and Focus page of the website um, as well. So not all of them, but so for example, after, after tonight, um, this presentation by Monday morning will be posted uh, on our, our website and we change those with each subsequent new Art and Focus. Uh, so if you have any questions about, about any of that, how to, how to watch these or share these with people after, after they take place, uh, by all means, email me or email our Director of Education, Summer Sharinghausen. Both of our contact information is on the website and we're happy to uh, talk with you or email back and forth to 
to let you know. Also, uh, on our website is the full schedule for Art and Focus. But on that note, I want to I want to mention that we had an Art and Focus schedule for the 18th of this month. Uh, unfortunately, that individual, Carrie Quick, Carrie Ann Quick, who's a metalsmith from San Diego State University, she won't be able to join us that night. And we're in fact going to just tack her presentation onto the end of the Art and Focus series. So we're going to add a, one more session at the very end. Um, so as of right now, we won't have any programming on the 18th. So uh, if you tune in, you won't find us. But if you look at our schedule you'll, uh, on our website, you'll see how um, uh, see when the next one is scheduled for. That will be in March as of right now. We're also working on a, on a very exciting unplanned art and focus, uh, which is sort of um, connected to our most current exhibition in the gallery at the Center for Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, we have our, our exhibit of World War II posters up right now. It's Work, Fight, Give. We had to delay the opening slightly because we had a sort of last minute exciting development. So uh, you should be able to come in and see the whole exhibition this weekend, but definitely by uh, Monday of next week. Uh, but we added a component to the center of the gallery. Uh, we added the labor camp. That's the, the working name of the artist who makes these posters, the labor camp uh, daily COVID-19 report. Um, and it's an individual who made, uh, starting in March of last year, made a, a poster every day, like a full size pen and ink poster um, that was related in some way to the, to the pandemic. And he did that for 225 days. Well, we're showing 120 reproductions of those posters that have been wheat pasted uh, on the walls in the center of our gallery. And so that's where I was today, just putting the final touches on that. Um, and we're, we're excited to sh share that component of this exhibit um, with everyone. It really makes for a stunning exhibition with the World War II posters around the perimeter of the gallery and the uh, posters by labor camp in the middle. So at some point during the run of the exhibition, we expect to have that artist join us. His name's Peter to uh, talk a little bit about why he's excited to show the posters alongside the World War II posters, and also to talk about the content of his posters as well. He'll give a presentation. Um, apart from that, I don't really have anything else, so I'm gonna introduce our speaker tonight. Matthew Kaplan uh, is a regional photographer who focuses on uh, both the built environment industry of Northwest Indiana, as well as uh, the close proximity of, of residential neighborhoods as well, uh, among other things. He is our current uh, exhibiting artist in the atrium at the Center for Visual and Performing Arts as part of our Straight Shooters series. Uh, and I'm gonna stop going on now because I know Matthew's got a lot of pictures to share with us. So I'm gonna invite Matthew to turn on his camera and start his presentation. And I'll make myself scarce for a little while. Oh, before I formally turn it over, we do things two ways here. Um, Matthew is going to give his presentation, do his talk, and at the end, we'll answer questions. So if at any point during the presentation you have a question, just go ahead and type it into the question and answer. We'll get to it at the end, but um, we'll wait till the end to answer questions. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Matthew. Um, great. Uh, thanks, Mike. I appreciate it. still that. on mute there, Matthew. Oh, uh, I... can you hear me now? because it doesn't show me on mute. Is anyone hearing? We're me? not picking your sound up, Matthew. I'm sorry. OK, well, it doesn't. Here's one of those things. No matter no matter what we do, there's always a little a little glitch, is there not? It says everyone says they can hear me. Maybe you're the one with the problem because. <laughs> oh, can you oh. hear me now? You know what, Matthew? Our panelists are telling me that they can me hear you and I forgot that I Turn my so sound down. We're not taking your sound up, Matthew. I'm sorry. So okay. Uh, well, it doesn't. Okay. Let's let's keep going here. Um, I'm going to share my screen. Um, thanks, Micah, for the introduction. Uh, this is the hardest part for me is sharing the screen. So here goes. Uh, great.
Okay, uh, again, uh, thanks, Micah, for the introduction. Uh, I want to thank Summer for helping me uh, get set up with this. And I want to give a big thanks to South Shore Arts for inviting me to present here and uh, for having uh, my show up in their gallery, and uh, specifically to John Kane and Bridget Covert, who have been extremely supportive of my work over the last five years. And I, I really couldn't be more grateful. So thank you again. Uh, I'm going to start out uh, with a little history of my history with the Calumet region, a touch on that. I'm going to touch a little on my life in photography, especially as it uh, relates to the region. I'm going to then get into the meat of the presentation. I'm going to show some of the techniques that I use to capture the industrial photography of the region that I do, and specifically, um, uh, I'm calling them techniques, but it's more like the ways I look for photos and uh, some of the technical things, but it's not going to be too technical. I'm going to look at a few of my favorite vantage points that I've uh, known over the years, and then I'm going to end up with a couple thoughts about the Calumet region. Anyway, uh, I've been a photographer for going on 50 years now. Actually, I think it's more than 50 years. And here I am in 1971 uh, as the high school yearbook photographer for George Rogers Clark High School in Hammond, Indiana. This is 1971. Uh, here's the high school where I went to. And it's the high school my father went to, and a lot of my uncles and my aunt went there. And uh, here's my yearbook. Uh, this is the earliest picture I'm going to show from 73. And this is, uh, I took that picture of the milkweed pods. And um, that's the kind of pictures I was taking when I was 17. But then after I left high school, I went to IU, Indiana University. And after a few years there, I decided I would work on being a photographer. And um, I was in photojournalism there, and I thought I would be a journalist or a documentary photographer. And one of the things when you're documenting, what am I going to document? So um, one of my teachers, uh, a very uh, a teacher who had a, a lot of, uh, was a very good teacher to me, a photo teacher, uh, gave me the advice, which is to look for something that uh, means something to you, something that you care about. And so in the mid 70s, I turned my camera on my hometown of Whiting, Indiana. This is Whiting in 1976. And uh, I've been documenting Whiting, Indiana and the surrounding Calumet region really since then. Now, anybody who knows anything about the Calumet region knows that it's an area of heavy industry, specifically oil refineries and steel mills. And uh, the, it, that uh, business started in the late 1880s when the Standard Oil Company built a refinery in Whiting. And uh, soon uh, steel mills located there as well. And uh, the jobs uh, were there and uh, people started coming for the jobs. And in the mid uh, in about 1916, my grandparents, who had come to the U.S. from Eastern Europe, uh, located in Whiting, Indiana, to start a plumbing business and to start a family. Whiting Plumbing and Heating was the plumbing business, and it was the Kaplan family. And about 50 years later, uh, I was born into that family. In case anyone's watching who is not exactly clear on where the Calumet region is, I just want to uh, start out by showing that it's the area at the very bottom of Lake Michigan. It can, it's basically the Indiana, Northwest Indiana corner that butts up against Illinois and Chicago, though I kind of consider it to be Chicago as well. Um, so uh, the Chicago people aren't, all, don't always want to be part of the Calumet region, but I think they are. So here's a close up map uh, that's showing the area. And again, my Calumet region in these photos, it's basically Whiting, Hammond, East Chicago, Indiana, and Gary. That's all in the Indiana side. And then I consider Chicago's industrial southeast side to be part of the region as well. And here we are. This is Whiting, where I grew up, even though I also grew up in Hammond. It's confusing. It's a part of Hammond that's right next to Whiting. And I won't go into it, but you'll hear me say Hammond or Whiting. It's right here. And if you'll notice that there's a lot of blank areas, um, uh, you'll see the green, you'll see the blue, uh, you'll see the streets, and then you'll see these big blank areas. And these big blank areas are where the heavy industry is. The widening refinery is here. This peninsula sticking out is all made land. That's the steel mills, inland in Youngstown when I was growing up. I saw a middle, and it's somebody else bought it recently now. 
And then uh, on the southeast side here, there were steel mills. They're not there anymore, but there's a lot of industrial facilities along the Calumet River up there. Now, my photography of the area falls into three periods of my life. Uh, as I said, I started in the 70s when I was in college, uh, documenting the areas around my house in, in Whiting and uh, Hammond, Robertsdale area. And um, I wasn't so concentrating on the industry at the time. I was looking for the people and the architecture. And uh, these are some of the pictures that I took when I was uh, 20 years old. I would probably take them a little differently now. Uh, but some of them, I think, hold up all right. And as I said, the industry shows up in places. Uh, here's the American maize products plant. But I wasn't concentrating on the industry. I was concentrating on the, just the community itself. But here's uh, the uh, famous all, uh, this is the Lever Brothers factory, which is still there. And there's the all sign there, um, which isn't there anymore, regretfully. Uh, and there's Arts Drive-In, which also isn't there anymore, uh, regretfully. And here's a shot uh, on Lake George, that's Federated Metals. That facility is still there. Uh, these train tracks aren't there anymore. Uh, they took them out and I put a wonderful bike path right where this gentleman is walking his dog, which is a great amenity in the area. Uh, but Federated Metals has left a, uh, a super fun site near it uh, back up here. So uh, there's a lot of uh, legacy of the area that's good and bad. Uh, moving forward, uh, jumping ahead a little bit. In the 80s, I started taking pictures of the area again. Now, uh, by this time, I'm a full-fledged uh, freelance photographer getting jobs and uh, companies are hiring me, but I was basically uh, shooting samples of the Calumet area because I love the region and I was here a lot. My family was here um, and I was visiting uh, regularly. So I would go collect pictures of the industry of the area. Uh, and basically what I was, I was in these uh, pictures, I'm focusing specifically on the industry and not really showing the community at all in the photos. Uh, basically, I was looking to, uh, to uh, one of my motives was to take samples uh, that I could use uh, to get corporate work. Um, and I eventually did crack the corporate market with Amico, who owned the refinery back then. And I shot within the refinery. Uh, the corporate uh, unit of Amico also hired me to go take pictures overseas. I shot on an offshore oil rig in the North Sea, and they sent me to Asia as well. And uh, it was one of the great assignments for a few years. It was uh, very fulfilling. I enjoyed getting into the refinery and taking pictures of the units in the refinery. This is one of my favorite. I show this even now sometimes. Uh, it's dawn um, showing that those cat cracker and that tower there, and I was in another tower and it was in the summertime and to get up, uh, to get a shot like this, in the, to get up in a tower, in the summertime, uh, dawn comes pretty early, so I was up pretty early to take this shot, and I'm pretty pleased with it. And I'm very grateful for the work that Amico gave me at the time. Um, what happened uh, is Amico got bought by BP, and a lot of this work went to uh, England. A lot of the, um, the assignments ended up going to other photographers, and uh, my photo career kept going, but it went in, in a different direction. But having said that, uh, now in the, the most recent period, uh, which is really my most prolific period photographing the Calumet region, it basically starts from about 2010 to the present. And now I'm photographing uh, the refinery, but I'm photographing exclusively from the outside. And I'm specifically working to show the industry in its relationship to the uh, um, residential areas nearby. Uh, that was, uh, this is an uh, area of Hammond and Whiting right near the refinery. Uh, this is Marktown in East Chicago, uh, which I'll talk about uh, later, but that also abuts the refinery. Um, I enjoy taking pictures of the steel mills when I can get near them. This is the one of the big blast furnaces. Uh, I love, uh, one of my great um, focuses is the Calumet River on the Illinois side. And here I am at uh, uh, 130th Street, um, photographing those beautiful bridges uh, on Torrance Avenue and in front of there. And then most recently, I've been working on getting pictures of Gary and the steel mills in Gary. 
and they're not so easy to get a viewpoint on. Um, it's been taking me a while, but I found a few places to get to, um, to get some viewpoints of the Gary Mills, and I'm going to try to find some more places. So that's kind of my, uh, um, my ambition is to uh, work at, uh, keep uh, getting more uh, different pictures of the Gary Steel Mills as well. And I, uh, so that's kind of what I've been doing. I want to discuss the, uh, some of my techniques. I'm going to go through about five of them. And the first one is uh, what I call backing up and shooting long. And basically what I mean is uh, sometimes you get too close. It's hard to show the um, structures in relationship to the refinery if you're too close to the structures in front. So here I am with the uh, Mascot Hall of Fame. That's in Whiting. It's uh, quite an interesting uh, new addition to 119th Street. And if you're right up by that uh, creature, uh, the, the refinery seems to be rather far away. But if you back up and shoot with a longer lens, by which I mean a telephoto lens, you can put the refinery and the, uh, the foreground into a better perspective of each other. Here's another example in East Chicago, an area called um, New Edition, which uh, abuts a tank farm. And uh, I'm about two blocks away from those streetlights when I'm taking this photo, and I'm using a telephoto lens. I often shoot with a 70 to 200 lens, and uh, then I'll even put a um, 2x extender on it and get into the 200 to 400 millimeter range. And usually uh, most of these pictures are in about the 300 millimeter range for the photography. Uh, and that compresses the view. and um, I think it basically, in some ways, it, it doesn't distort the view. In some ways, it makes the view more uh, real, in my opinion. This is a little sliver of a view uh, on the southeast side of Chicago, uh, and I just really love it with the steel, with the uh, Skyway Bridge back there. And uh, this is another view of the Gary uh, Steel Mills, again, with a very long lens, and it, it, it kind of turns the picture into a series of layers. I don't know how to describe it, but you wouldn't get this view without getting far away and shooting with a long lens. And here's an example of what the long lens shooting long does for you. I took these a few weeks ago. Uh, here's a little notch in the houses uh, that show the Whiting refinery. And I'm fairly close to the houses in the foreground, but it happens to be a situation where I've got quite a lot of room to back up. So here I am with about an 80 millimeter, 80 millimeter focal length on the lens. But if I back up about 50 feet and uh, rack the lens out a little bit, you can see how the, um, the refinery towers get bigger in proportion to the houses in the foreground. So again, here they are now, and here they are now. And it's, it's a stronger photo, I think, to show it this way. And here's even a more uh, extreme example. Again, this is the Whiting Refinery. This is on New York Avenue, if anybody knows this, the area. And uh, there's a, you can see the tops of a few refinery towers. I'm shooting from across the street here a couple weeks ago. So I took this picture and then I went back up about 100 yards into the Lost Marsh golf course where when they're not playing golf, you can get into there with, uh, safely this time of year. And you can see uh, these towers, which you could barely see from across the street, you get about 100 yards back and they really uh, they jump up into the frame. So that's, uh, that's one of my tricks. Uh, I call it back up, shoot long. When you're shooting long like this, you've got to have a uh, telephoto lens. When you use a telephoto lens, uh, you often need a tripod or a monopod to keep the camera steady. And, uh, and I often schlep a, a tripod, a monopod, and a 15 pound weight in order to weight the camera down because any little vibrations will degrade the, the sharpness of the photo. And even having done all that, um, sometimes here's a shot, uh, a similar shot, uh, which I really liked. I saw the picture. I scrambled to get into position. I found a place I could set the tripod down. It took about 15 minutes for me to get in position to start clicking the shutter. And just as I did, somebody parked their car in front of their house. And uh, for me, it, it kind of uh, really marred the shot. Uh, I thought the shot would have been perfect without the car. but uh, the car was there, so uh, that's the brakes. But that's that's what happens. Uh, you have to. These views aren't uh, always available. You may see it, and you start to back up, and you end up in somebody's yard, and they don't like that. 
or uh, sometimes the trees get in the way. So it's, it's an exercise in walking around a lot and uh, finding the, the places where you can get these kind of shots. Another technique a lot of photographers use is called a dusk and dawn shooting or blue hours shooting. And this involves getting to a place to take a picture either before dawn, like here, I'm on the Calumet River at 130th Street, photographing the Lafarge cement plant. Uh, and it's right before dawn. So the uh, sun hasn't come out yet. The light in the sky is blue. Uh, and it's in good balance with the lights from the, uh, from the cement plant there. Here's another example uh, where the, I'm shooting at dusk here in Whiting uh, last year. Somebody had beautiful Christmas decorations up and I backed up a little bit and uh, waited till dusk. And I think that the balance of the light in the sky and the lights in the refinery and then the lights, the Christmas lights in their beautifully decorated house, they all come together, but sometimes they all come together for only 10 or 15 minutes. And you, you need to be there for those 10 or 15 minutes when the sky is just in the right balance with the, uh, with the lights of the, the uh, factory and the houses. And I'm going to show an example here of just how this can really transform a photo. Here's a photo um, I'm showing. A, well, anyway, this is a scene that I found a, couple, a year or two ago, and I really liked the scene. Here it is in the daytime. This is in Whiting with the refinery back there. But here it is uh, at dusk. And so you see it's the same scene, uh, but uh, the light here is interesting, but I think this light uh, turns it into something magical. So again, it's getting there, finding the scene, and getting there in the right light. And here's another example. Uh, we've got the refinery behind this house here uh, at, in the daytime. And here's a pretty close to a similar match of the very same house and the refinery at nighttime, or at dusk, excuse me. So there's still some blue in the sky, uh, but the lights, it's not just the, the lights in the refinery that have value now, the, the street light has value and gives some nice modeling light on the house. And even that shamrock, I took this last year about uh, near St. Patrick's Day and the people in the house had their shamrock in the in the, the green window green shamrock in the window which i think adds a touch of uh, green to the shot and even uh, at night that the cars uh, sometimes aren't as objectionable to me at least as they are in the daytime even though i wish that car weren't there but i didn't feel like knocking on the door and asking them to move it so i just uh, dealt with it and if you're lucky sometimes the blue hours aren't just blue they can really be a spectacular color here i am photographing just a few blocks from my mom's house where I grew up and where my mom still lives. This is the, uh, it's Cargill now, but it was a uh, Mazo, American Maze products before. Uh, and I was there, um, the day didn't seem very promising, but just after the sun went down, the sky erupted in this amazing, uh, you know, pastel color. And I got some shots uh, that I just thought were spectacular. So, you need to be there. You often need to be there uh, before the light changes. So you need to be there before dawn, usually an hour before dawn. And often the best light comes half an hour to an hour after uh, sunset. Another technique, another little trick that I use and a lot of um, industrial photographers use is to shoot in cold weather. And uh, here's the Whiting Refinery again. This was shot on the polar vortex day about two years ago exactly. And uh, just look at what that, how that steam shows up. Um, I just, you get shots in cold weather, especially extremely cold weather that you don't get uh, any other time. And also cold weather, here I'm shooting the Calumet River. Uh, it's great to see the river with ice in it. You know, you get that in cold weather, this barge moving along from 100th Street heading south. The bridge is up in the background of the 106th Street Bridge. Uh, Whiting Beach, uh, you know, when it gets coated by ice, uh, it, you know, creates an interesting effect. Um, here's a Whiting again with the refinery behind. And one of the things, one of the reasons why it's good to shoot in the winter months, this was shot on a pretty cold day, but it wasn't spectacularly cold. But in winter, you'll notice those trees back there have, don't have their leaves. So in wintertime, the leaves are off the trees and you can see through those trees. Plus there's some bushes in the front of those houses that have no foliage now. 
if I took this picture in the summertime, there basically wouldn't be a shot because uh, almost everything that you're seeing in this photo would be obscured by the foliage. So it's an advantage in the winter time, or at least the winter months, to shoot when the leaves are off the trees. I, I like foliage, but uh, sometimes I wish it weren't there in my photos. Uh, snow can really help the photos. Uh, here we've got some areas in the foreground of this shot, which are, when they're not covered by snow, they're basically dirty brown, um, you know, sandy areas. And I think the snow covers them up pretty nicely. I'm shooting this from the Klein Avenue uh, bridge, not the bridge, but from Klein Avenue. And it wasn't open when I was taking this picture. It's open again. I wouldn't advise people to shoot this shot right now. Um, Whiting, Indiana, here again, uh, towards the refinery. It's something of an obsession of mine, I guess. People realize that. Uh, the snow, uh, I think, cre creates a quaint effect here. That I love the snow on those roofs. It makes it look like a quaint village there. And then the snow, if you're lucky enough to, or hardy enough to be out there shooting in the snow. And I should say, uh, when I go on those cold days, I dress warmly, obviously, and I try to remember to bring hand warmers uh, and get them going before I uh, get out there. And uh, you also have to temper your expectations because you're not going to be able to shoot as fast in the cold weather. And, you, and it's great to have a car nearby too to get into because uh, on those really cold days, it can be uh, pretty difficult, especially with your hands. In any event, if, you, if you're lucky enough to have some snow while you're photographing, these two guys were fishing off of the... Uh, right near the old U.S. Steel South Works, where the slip is, and they fish there now. I stopped because I saw a bunch of people fishing, and just as I was getting to take the pictures, some really beautiful snowflakes started falling. And I think they, they changed a shot which was pretty average into a shot which is uh, above average, and the snow in the air gives a very dynamic uh, element to the photos. And that's my next technique, is to find ways to include dynamic elements in your photos. For instance, here we are in Whiting Park with the surfers uh, in the, the ArcelorMittal uh, uh, steel mills behind them. And the waves and the surfers, um, they had motion, they had life, and they give the, the photo a sense of time. At least they do to me. Uh, anytime I can get steam in a photo, uh, it's great. Plus the, um, the crane there, you can get them in uh, with the motion in some way, uh, which if, it, if it's not in motion, it, it, it suggests motion. Uh, again, uh, uh, this is another shot that I took during the polar vortex uh, with the refinery towers and the billows of smoke coming out of those smokestacks, I think, uh, add a whole lot of interest to a photo like this. Um, it doesn't have to be smoke, however. Uh, again, the refinery, uh, always the refinery. Um, this liquor store here recently upgraded their uh, sign, and I think it looks great, and they redid their facade. So I was there about six weeks ago taking photos, and I was trying to get photos where the cars weren't in the, with just Indianapolis Boulevard, it's a pretty busy uh, thoroughfare. Uh, but I, I finally gave up. Uh, I got a few shots without the cars, but uh, I started uh, working uh, with the cars. And especially when there was a big clump of cars going by and I got this nice impressionistic set of about six cars going by with their lights trailing. And I think it adds, uh, you know, some life to the photo uh, in a way that maybe this photo doesn't. So I wasn't looking for this, but I decided to go with it and I think it helps. Uh, another example, uh, two set example, again, back at the Gary Steel Mill. And uh, I took this over the summer. I like the shot. I love this set of buildings. And I've always wondered what the number one bop shop is. And if anybody has, hasn't already opened up a bar or something at Gary called the number one bop shop, I think they're missing an opportunity. But in any event, uh, I think this shot has a lot going for it. But I went back there about uh, three weeks ago uh, during the winter time. And I think uh, the same shot with a lot more steam uh, and actually a little more interesting light, I think this shot has a lot more going for it. And if I were a photo editor, I think if I had you know, these two shots to choose, I think I would choose this one. Now, uh, again, I'm always looking for something to add movement to the photo. If there's a flare stack, I want it to have a, a flame on it. 
if I'm on the Calumet River on a beautiful morning where there's a little bit of uh, fog uh, in the air, like I am here, I just pray for a boat to come by and I got this lovely little tugboat coming by. Uh, you know, you don't always get what you want, but if you're there enough, you'll, uh, you'll get it once in a while. I, I was just delighted when this little thing came by. Uh, if I'm on the, um, here I am uh, trying to take pictures of uh, the, the, sea, the lake level in Lake Michigan, which has been very high. This was back in March, uh, shooting uh, from Calumet Park on the Illinois side towards the Indiana side and uh, the waves were crashing and I went to a, a quick shutter speed to, to catch the waves crashing like that and I think it adds a heck of a lot to the photo, if I say so myself. And then that leads me to my last little technique and it's, not, it's very obvious is uh, in the Calumet uh, area we have water and you gotta take, make use of it because there's a lot of it around. So this is the Calumet River, uh, early morning, shooting towards this wonderful nest of bridges. My back is to the bridge at uh, Ewing Avenue, looking towards the bridge at 95th Street, the Skyway Bridge, and those railroad bridges. And the reflections in the water, I think, uh, um, that's why I took it. Uh, the other thing about the water uh, on the lower part of the lake is uh, you, a lot of these facilities are built out into the lake, so you can get some shots with the swimmers. Uh, and then the industry behind them. Uh, this isn't just uh, with water. I'm also using a pretty long lens here to emphasize the steel mill building back there in East Chicago, three or four miles away, I'm, I'm imagining. Uh, but we're lucky to have that uh, access to that kind of shoreline here. You don't have to get into a boat to get a, a shot like this. Um, water, uh, the Calumet River again has wonderful bridges. I'm shooting towards a bridge here, and I'm shooting from a bridge. I, I'm on the Torrance Avenue Bridge, shooting towards this railroad bridge uh, west of there. And I was loving the reflection. Uh, and just as I was, uh, I mean, as I was shooting the reflection, uh, this speedboat came by and it distorted the reflection. So it has the combination of um, the reflection and you know this kind of interesting abstract distortion. Uh, Calumet River from 106th Street, everyone, I just love uh, a blue hour shot with the reflections in the water. And the other thing about finding a, a scenes uh, across the water is uh, you don't have to worry quite so much about uh, things that are going to block your view because uh, there aren't going to be trees or uh, weird houses or anything. You get better views uh, or like this one and Gary uh, shooting in Miller Beach shooting towards the refinery with a very, excuse me, the oil steel mill with a very long lens. Uh, and I think the choppy waves, uh, you know, it gave a, give a nice texture to the water here. Um, shooting across the water from Calumet Park again towards the uh, refinery. Uh, and you've got a whole lot of things in combination here. The water, the, um, the cold weather, this was a cold weather shot. It was taken in December and that steam adds something to the shot. And I had seen this guy getting ready to put his boat in. So I kind of found a place and waited him out. I think he was, I don't, I think he knew I was waiting for him, but I, he was too anxious to get out to do his fishing and he ignored me. And I, I think that the shot really helps the shot to have the boat going by as well. And again, I, nothing I like better than a boat going by. Uh, here I am on the Calumet River uh, photographing this Cargill plant near 130th, near Torrance Avenue. And the boat uh, does a nice uh, number on the reflections in the water. This was right before the sun came up. And then about 20 minutes later, uh, he did something uh, to the left and he came back moving to the right. And now the sun's up uh, more fully and it's, it's, it's a different shot. It's kind of the same shot, but a different shot. And uh, I felt uh, lucky that I decided to stay around. I didn't know he was coming back, but I was glad he did. And uh, one of my all time favorite water shots, uh, many of these are in the show that's up. This one is, this has been in almost every show I've ever put up. Uh, I, I love this picture. It was taken in the year uh, 2000 from the 100th Street Bridge looking towards the steel mills that aren't there anymore, um, looking south and the water, the reflections in the water, the reflections of that gorgeous sunset sky, um, you know, really, I think, to turn the shot into something uh, that I really, I really enjoy. And then uh, I guess um, 
it's not really a technique, but I'm fortunate that I get to keep coming back. I, I don't live in the Calumet region. I mean, I live in Chicago now, but uh, my mom still lives down there and I have close relatives, my sister and my uncle and my aunt, and I'm in the area many times a week now. So I, I find that I'm coming back and visiting places now that I uh, visited uh, 30 years ago. And here's an example. Uh, the first place I'm gonna talk about is specifically the Indiana Harbor Canal. And it's a very specific viewpoint. Uh, all, the shots I'm gonna show are all taken within about 20 feet of each other over the course of about 33 years. Uh, just in case anyone wants to know where we are, uh, again, these are the steel mills sticking out into the water, into Lake Michigan. The boats come in through here and they dock uh, in this area and all through here to unload their ore. And the bridge I'm talking about is about right here between Indiana and Harbor. There's a uh, road called Dickey Road. It's public and there's a pull in you can park at. And uh, you can get uh, shots of these ore loaders looking towards the lake. These are not these ore loaders anymore, excuse me. These ones uh, have been gone since the early 1990s, but they were there when I took this picture. They were there when I took this blue hours shot of that same location. So, uh, but these big structures in the top of the frame aren't there anymore, but this stuff at the bottom, most of it is. So now I'm concentrating on what's at the bottom of that frame, uh, which I think is an amazing view to have this uh, structure carrying this pipe over the canal. It, it, it uh, fills in the frame at the top in a way that I really love. And uh, this shot was taken in 1993. And when you're shooting off of a bridge, photographers who may be listening uh, know that uh, there's nothing more frustrating than to take long exposure shots off of a bridge. This is shot at dusk. I don't know what my exposure was, but I'm sure it was uh, close to a second. So any vibration on the bridge is going to shake the, the uh, camera. And this is an area where a lot of trucks go by. So take, getting a shot like this is an exercise in being patient, in uh, waiting, hoping that the trucks, you get a minute or two when nobody's going over that bridge and you can crank off about 10 shots in a row. And hopefully one of them is sharp like this one is. Uh, it's an example of a blue hour shot that I think really works. And here's almost the exact same location, uh, shooting with a uh, similar lens. The first shot was taken in 1993. This shot was taken in 2010 uh, on a very cold day, you, might have, you can probably guess. And uh, it, it's, I love just this composition. Uh, I could shoot this composition forever. In fact, I've been shooting this composition forever. This was taken the same viewpoint in 2018. Here's the same viewpoint just this last year. Uh, lucky enough to get there when a boat was going by with a, uh, that's a fuel barge. The, behind me, uh, the canal uh, services the BP refinery and I see occasionally uh, boats go by to uh, uh, loaded with fuel and I happened to be there when this one was going by and I think it adds a lot to the photo. It certainly made me happy to be there to capture it. Sometimes I get a little abstract and I start uh, just playing with the shapes of these uh, the ore loaders and the pipes and every once in a while you get very very lucky and this was uh, about two years ago. I got there for the dawn and I got this amazing pastel sunrise with um, the, um, uh, you know, the reflection in the water that just, uh, you know, uh, it's dreamlike because uh, the water usually isn't that still and the sun, the sky doesn't look like that and a little bit of haze in the sky. Uh, that's what you get if you can just keep coming back to the same place as I'm fortunate enough to be able to do. So the next location, I've already shown a few pictures from it, is the 100th Street Bridge on the Calumet River in Chicago. I think in some ways, I think if someone told me I could only go to one location for the rest of my life, it would probably be this one because there's a lot to photograph here. Here I'm shooting towards the Skyway Bridge. Uh, if you can see here, uh, this yellow line is the Skyway. Here's the bridge and the photos are taken just south of the bridge south of the Skyway Bridge, excuse me. And again, uh, there's a lot of barge action there. Uh, and many times of the day, you can get different interesting photos if you keep coming back there. Uh, I just, I get a kick out of watching the, uh, the guys do their work. 
there's some salt, uh, big salt piles there, which uh, create interesting shapes. Uh, believe it, this is not uh, a glacier in Switzerland. This is salt piles on the southeast side of Chicago, uh, just off the Calumet Lee uh, 100th Street Bridge. If you're lucky, you'll get there when a big ship goes by. Uh, I'm cheating a bit. This isn't from the bridge. This is of the bridge. But uh, it's it's fun to get there when the ships go by. I I just uh, I get I don't know. I love watching these boats go by. Uh, sometimes you can do things with uh, structurally, make some abstracts. Uh, barges go by. Um, the salt pile gets covered by. Uh, um, this tarpaulin, and then uh, when the snow uh, blows against it, it creates to me a very interesting abstract shape. Uh, this picture is in the show. I love this shot. It's from the bridge, shooting towards this uh, Norfolk Southern uh, uh, Railroad Bridge, shooting to the north, right at the blue hours with a long lens with reflections. It's got a lot of uh, my techniques all wrapped up into one shot. And then uh, this structure used to be there. Uh, this ore loader or some kind of material loading facility has been there for decades. I've been photographing it for decades. Uh, but recently they tore it down. Uh, this was in 2018, about two years ago, they started to tear it down. Photographers everywhere uh, lament the lack of that uh, Star Wars looking crane there, but it's gone now. However, uh, the fact that it's gone opens up a view uh, towards an area where they occasionally will park an interesting ship to unload things near 106th Street on the Calumet River. And again, this is this; these are in Chicago. So the, the ore loader is gone or whatever that thing was, but uh, there it does open up a view that you can make use of. But I still lament the lack of this view. This This shot was taken in 2020, excuse me, in the year 2000. We're in 2021 right now. This was 21 years ago. Um, shooting from the 100th Street Bridge, shooting south towards the old Republic Steel Mill, which was operating there, but it's not operating there anymore. So all that great steam in the background there uh, and that boat going by and that, uh, that uh, crane in the foreground. Well, anyway, I think it makes an incredibly perfect composition from the 100th Street Bridge. Now, almost everything in this photograph is gone. Uh, the river is still there, the barges are still there, but the structures aren't, that or that uh, crane is gone, and all that steel mill area is gone too. Uh, so um, anyway, I uh, miss them, but there's still lots to photograph from that bridge. Now the last area I'm going to look at in detail is Marktown, which is an incredible uh, uh, district of, industri of uh, employee housing in East Chicago, Indiana. You can see it right here, if you, if you can see it where it's highlighted. It's actually pretty near that view of uh, Indiana Harbor. It's just this little bit of uh, residential area totally surrounded by the refinery to the northwest and the steel mills uh, to all, in all the other directions. And it was, uh, it was in designed, it was built in 1917 uh, by the steel mill uh, at the time. I think it was the Mark Manufacturing Steel Company. And they hired a, a Howard Van Doren Shaw, a, a very notable Chicago architect, to, uh, to design these extremely interesting structures, these uh, employee housing. They, he laid the whole thing out. It's designed like a European village. The streets are narrow. People park on the sidewalks and they walk in the streets. So it's this narrow, pushed together little area. That's the a steel mill building, a tin mill building. Uh, in the old days, people living here would walk to work at these buildings. I think it looks phenomenal in the snow. And you can see the roof lines are amazing there. Uh, I think it looks great at any time, frankly. But the trouble is, uh, it's crumbling. It's crumbling and it's going away. It's a tragedy. Um, it's so near the refinery now. The refinery. Uh, Marktown didn't move, but the refinery has uh, gotten closer and closer to Marktown. And buildings that uh, used to be there are, are getting torn down one at a time. This building on the, uh, that's another refinery facility there, a, a pipe still. And that yellow building to the right of the photo, uh, I took this photo two years ago, and that building is gone. I went there about three weeks ago and that building was no longer there. Look at this wonderful duplex. I, I think this is one of the most amazing buildings I've ever seen. 
It's a duplex. Uh, this was taken two years ago. The building on the right is boarded up. Obviously, nobody's living there. The building on the left, somebody was living there two years ago. But uh, now, uh, the last time I was there, both uh, buildings were boarded up. And I'm pretty sure in a couple of months, that building will be torn down too. I hope not, but I, I, I'm guessing it will be. And I just think it's, it's criminal to take, this is a part of the uh, heritage of the Calumet area. It's a part of the industrial heritage, heritage of the country. And I, I don't understand why it's being allowed to uh, you know, crumble away like it is. But it is being allowed to crumble away, hopefully not completely. Uh, and again, there's uh, the, that's the Coker unit from the BP refinery, and they built that. Uh, it opened up in about 2012 to uh, process tar sands, and that's the part of the refinery that's been built closer to Marktown. And it's, uh, it's, I think the refinery would kind of rather Marktown weren't there anymore. And my understanding is they're the ones who are buying the houses as they become available. And when they get uh, the whole uh, house together, they tear it down. Anyway, uh, I hope this can be avoided. Uh, I'm showing this photo, which was taken about three years ago, because it matches up almost uh, uh, exactly with this photo of the same view, which I took in 1977. Um, and I just, uh, I, nothing I like better than seeing a photo from now and a photo from then. And you can see the building to the right is gone. But a lot of these buildings are still here. There's a lot to save in Marktown, and I sure hope it gets saved. So uh, there's that. And now I'm going to uh, finish up a little bit with some of my thoughts on the region, and I need to actually read this because it's tricky. Um, anyway, I, I want to say a few words about the region, and especially about the problematic industrial legacy of the Calumet region. And I think my photos uh, sometimes take a kind of a romantic view of the industry there. Uh, and I've kind of been accused of uh, maybe romanticizing the toxic pollution of, in my photos. And I guess I, I plead guilty to some of that. I don't romanticize the toxic pollution, but I think I do maybe romanticize the area. Uh, but I'm also aware, greatly aware of the damage that uh, these oil refineries and the steel mills have done over the years to the air quality and the water quality of the region and to the lives of the people who live there. And uh, I was a person who lived there, grew up there, and I grew up there at a time when things were even worse. And maybe it would have been better uh, if the industries hadn't located there. Um, the south shore of Lake Michigan is used to be an area of great hunting and fishing, and it was also a, a great area of uh, biological diversity. People came from all over the, the country to fish and to hunt there, as well as to uh, do research there on ecology. The University of Chicago did. So, um, and they really, the businesses, but it, they did locate there and they've eaten up the dunes. The steel mills have eaten up a lot of the dunes. Um, but, you know, industry located there and they came there in the, you know, more than a hundred years ago and they came there uh, to make products that people wanted. And they provided jobs that people wanted too. And uh, people came there willingly and they came there from all over the world. People like my grandparents who had come from Tsarist Russia and they moved to eventually to the Calumet region. And I have to say, I'm glad I was born in the Calumet region in 1955 and wasn't born in Russia in 1955. No, um, no offense to Russians, but I'm glad I was born where I was. And that's because my grandparents came to the Calumet region in 1916. And the industries located there initially uh, because the area at the time was remote from the residential areas of Chicago, but eventually uh, the residential areas grew up around the industries and they found themselves no longer on the fringes of residential areas, but right in the middle of them. And that's the Calumet region I was born into, uh, kind of a toxic stew of air pollution and water pollution. And... Uh, and, uh, but it was also an area crowded with uh, relatives of mine and immigrants from all over the world. But I tell you, I had more, I had great aunts, great uncles, grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers, sisters, more cousins than I can name. Some of them probably might even be watching this presentation. And uh, I th when I think of the Calumet region, I can't separate these industries from the, 
feelings of family that I have for the area. And I, I think uh, I'm not alone in that. I think other people feel that way too. And I think there's something happening now that's really interesting uh, right now because the area is uh, actually cleaner than it's ever been. And uh, there's more wildlife around uh, these deer uh, near the refinery. I took this a couple of years ago. I don't, don't remember deer near the refinery when I was growing up there. They might've been there. I don't remember them. I certainly don't remember swans and geese on Lake George uh, when I was growing up. So I, I think the area is uh, maybe changing. Uh, the industry is still there, but it's actually, maybe it's finding a balance between the nature and the industry and the residential areas. And I, 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 I hope that's what's happening. I, I, I definitely think that uh, is a future, it may be a model for the future, not just for the Calumet region, but for other industrial areas as well. And uh, I'm just gonna close by giving a shout out to this initiative that the, uh, is ongoing to create a, a, Calum a Calumet National Heritage Area of a, a great section of the Calumet region from the uh, National Park in, um, um, uh, excuse me, uh, Pullman all the way to the dunes. And uh, it's uh, being fostered by the Field Museum as some other organizations, the Calumet Heritage Partnership and the Calumet Collaborative. And if you're interested in the area, I think uh, it's worth a look. Okay, well, that's the presentation. I want to thank everyone if you've stayed on board. Uh, here's some contact information for me. Uh, if you want to see my photos on Instagram, I post pretty regularly, and a lot of them are of the Calumet region. And if anyone wants to contact me, there's my email address. So again, thank you so much for uh, staying with me, and I'll answer any questions if there's any time. Uh, what do I need to do? There is time. If you stop sharing your screen, um, that would okay. make it a little less bouncy for people. Uh, so yes, there are people who hung on. We had about 50 people join us tonight. Oh, wonderful. Uh, so that was a, a great turnout, Matthew. And I know you haven't been looking at the chat, but I- uh, Not at all. But Gary, Gary let you know there's some cousins watching. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I wanna say thank you before, there's a few questions that are coming in from people. And I wanna say thank you though, um, not just for sharing the story with us in your photographs, but also, um, one of my one of my great pleasures with hosting Art in Focus and, and artist talks in general, but uh, especially at Art in Focus, um, is when the artists are generous enough to sort of demystify their process, uh, okay. and, and, and you know especially to the extent to which you did, which showing the picture that you could have used, the picture you did use, the picture you took decades ago. I think it's just absolutely um, just a wonderful experience for me. And that's just you know me gushing a little bit. Uh, I have a question, but I want to make sure we get to a few of the questions. And if I have to ask you later, I'll ask you later. So okay. I'm going to actually pull up the Q and A here and see what we got. Um, early on, somebody asked, I think, when you were showing the cars that were in the images and talking about how you thought they maybe sullied the image a little bit. He, uh, somebody asked, Robin Kaplan asked, do you? Oh, a relative, perhaps. Have you ever considered uh, <laughs> asking people to move their cars to help you get a, a, a clear shot of something? Uh, does that go against uh, their word, not mine, your ethos of getting the community shots? Uh, well, I, I try to avoid interacting with people if I can, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> there was a, a photograph, uh, that photograph of the house with the Christmas tree, the Christmas lights, if you remember that one. Uh, um, I've took that shot and there was a car parked in front of it as the shot, um, I mean, as I was getting ready to take the shot, this woman came up and parked her pickup truck in front of the house to unload her groceries. I actually went up and I, I said what I was doing and I asked her if she'd move the car and she said she would. And then she moved it over about 10 feet, but it wasn't far enough. So I then I asked her to move it over farther and she did. Uh, so there was one time when I actually did ask someone to move their car, but, uh, I don't really feel like knocking on the doors and asking them to move the car. Maybe if someone were paying me to take these photos, uh, which nobody is, you know, I, I do things uh, when, when it's a paid job that I don't do if I'm just out there shooting for myself. Uh, basically, if the car's in the way, I'll try to come back another day. And that's kind of, um, I'm lucky enough to have that ability to keep coming back. Um, on, on that note, I. Uh... Well, not dissimilar when you when you go to these areas, and I, I presume you know because you go to them so frequently, 
uh, do you have a vision? So Julia, I should say the name, Julia Hunter asked, do you have a vision in your head before you go shooting that day? Hey, Julia. Um, uh, sometimes I do. Uh, sometimes I actually have, I know, um, like, well, one of the ways I'm shooting is I'm often uh, coming down to, to look after our, our mom who is uh, still living in our house. And so I'll shoot before I go to our house or I'll shoot after I go to our house. And I'll, if it's in the morning, I'll think about where I might go. So I, I definitely try to have a location in mind. I don't usually have a shot in mind, but I'll be thinking, oh, this might be a good day to go to 100 Street Bridge, or maybe this is a good day to go, uh, you know, if it's later in the day, maybe I'll try going to, uh, um, over by uh, the steel mills or something. It, it does help to have a, an area in mind, especially when you need to get there ahead of the sunset or before the sunrise, because as I said, the, the worst thing in the world, I don't know if I said this, but I said this to myself many times, is, is to be in the car when the sun is just right, but you haven't gotten to the location yet. So um, I definitely, it definitely helps to have a, 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 at least a location in mind, and uh, occasionally I'll actually have the shot in mind as well. Hmm. Um, Mike McDonald asked if there's, uh, he's mentioning some of the early photos uh, where you have the, the citizens, the denizens, as he puts it, of the area, he thinks yeah. they're stunning. Um, do you have any thoughts about, he asked it, doing more work in that direction. I assume he means doing more work documenting the people who live there, not just the structures. You know, I'm always thinking I should, and hey, Mike, um, uh, thanks for tuning in. Uh, I'm always thinking I should shoot people more. Uh, and sometimes I, I feel like I should just leave the telephoto lens out of my kit and just go with a wider lens because it would probably force me to shoot different kind of shots. Uh, but uh, my enjoyment of the fit photos actually in some ways comes from kind of a meditation I'm doing with myself when I'm taking these photos. And uh, when, you're, when, you, when you've got a person in front of you, um, I'll, I actually sometimes get into conversations with people, really meaningful conversations, but then I really don't feel like asking to take their photo because I feel like I'm, uh, you know, I've had a nice conversation with somebody. We talk about our history. And then I say, can I take your photo? I feel like I'm um, violating them or something. I, I should do that more, uh, but I don't. So uh, what I would like to do is spend some time with those old photos, frankly, and uh, put a show together uh, of those photos from the 1970s. But uh, I should do more people photos, and, but I don't. I do them occasionally. Uh, I also don't, I worry about showing them as well. I have some photos of people I've taken recently that I think make really interesting photos, but I'm not sure they show the people to their best advantage. And uh, I, it's not that I live there, I mean, I, but I'm there all the time and I'll, I might see them in the store or somewhere. I mean, I. I, I don't know. I um, I kind of worry uh, that uh, you know that I they might be offended. Basically, hmm. interesting. Um, I I want I, now that I let a few people ask their question, I want to ask my question, which is um, when you're showing all the images of you take it of Marktown and you're watching. Uh, well, we're watching. You're watching too, I suppose. But we're seeing it sort of change so rapidly right now because mm -hmm. of structures being torn down. And I just wonder. I mean. Are there other photographers that you know of who have not only photographed and documented, let's say Marktown specifically, but to such a, a great extent and over such a long period of time? Like, I mean, are, I guess what I'm asking is, is like, is there a possibility that your documentation is maybe like the definitive documentation of these, these lost structures? Oh, well, actually there's a photographer, an excellent photographer named Dave Giordano, and if anyone wants to look him up, uh, he's, I think, the best photographer that I know uh, personally. And he did a whole series of Mark Town in the early uh, aughts, in like the 2000s. He actually shot uh, structures, he shot the people a lot as well. He's a fantastic photographer. So uh, he's got a big documentation of Mark Town. I don't know uh, who's in there right now doing it. I think I'm over the last four or five years, I think uh, I'm maybe doing some of the most documentation of the area. And uh, frankly, I wish I didn't have to be documenting it. I mean, I wish, I, I really hope uh, it can be preserved. Uh, Paul Meyer, I, if people know Paul, uh, he lives there and he's been working hard to uh, 
uh, keep the area preserved. Um, but you know, you're up against multinational corporations and all their money. And even though the place is a landmark, I don't understand why they can tear these structures down, but they keep doing it. So uh, I hope I'm not documenting the demise of Marktown, uh, but I'm, um, I may be. Yeah, that's, that's a somber note, uh, and I don't want to end on it, but so I want to ask one other question. Um, so I can relate, like when I went to art school, I wanted to draw nothing but factories and buildings from home, even though I fled at home at 18 because I didn't want to be here anymore. Uh, okay. And so I feel like in some ways, whether, you know, you have control over it or not, this area formed sort of my, the foundation of my aesthetic sensibility and my subjective aesthetic sensibilities. And so somebody asked, like, do you ever give thought to why, why all the steel mills? Like, why, why are you drawn to these? Do you have any sort of meditations or ruminations on, on, on that? Um, well, I mean, to one extent, it's just I like photographing big things, you know, big things that are exposed. Uh, you know, they're out there and you can get them. Um, there's a, uh, I, but I think a lot of it has to do with growing up here. I think, uh, I mean, getting a little more introspective. Um, you know, I grew up as a kid. Uh, well, I mean, as a kid growing up here, um, I didn't realize it was something special to be living uh, two doors down from a big factory. Uh, these structures formed basically the early, uh, some of the early uh, visual I images of my life. And uh, I think um, I, I, uh, the mills and the refineries, you know, just basically were uh, part of my childhood. And so when I'm photographing now, I think to some extent, I'm kind of trying to capture that. I mean, there's, I think I always, I've said this before, uh, it's the kind of the view of looking out the window of your family station wagon. I know we'd go get some uh, ice cream and we'd go by the steel mills, sometimes on the Southeast side, they'd be uh, pounding and there'd be smoke and uh, you'd see fire in there. And it was awesome. And when you're 10 years old, it's just, uh, it's an awesome sight. Uh, when you're 15 years old and it's uh, 1970 and it's Earth Day and you realize you live in a toxic dump, uh, you feel differently about it. And then it's interesting now that I'm 65, um, I feel differently about it again. And, you know, I, I look on it uh, again, I look on it with uh, sentimentality, but I also, I look on it. Um, I think the region, I think there's a lot of life and vitality to the area. And I think it's uh, on the rebound right now. So um, I guess it's because this is my childhood. I mean, I'm photographing my youth in some ways, but taking these pictures of these gigantic structures. Um, and sometimes I think why I'm doing it too. Uh, I'm not sure, and I'm doing it right now more than ever. This, it's become an obsession with me recently as I'm getting older and I still have my legs. So I I'm, I'm feel like every time I can go out to shoot, it's precious. And so that's what I'm pointing my camera at. I, uh, I wanna end on that because that's a much more uplifting and inspiring uh, note to end upon. Um, okay. Matthew, I, I appreciate you being gracious enough to share your, your time with us and these wonderful images. Uh, so just thank you once again. Uh, just a reminder to everybody, our next scheduled Art and Focus is in March. Uh, we've been making a habit of sending out uh, social media posts the day of, as well as email, um, e e email newsletters the day of as well, just to keep everybody uh, in the know and reminded it's easy to forget things and you know i really love these these big turnouts you know having 50 50 different households tune in so spread the word and we'll keep bringing you content but uh until next time um well uh we'll, we'll, that'll be it for now so i'm gonna i'm gonna end the broadcast and I, I really appreciate it so thank, thank you. you and uh good night matthew see you mike i see everybody thank you for show thank you for being there you're welcome. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.